Hi, welcome back to Mind Control. People say you can't change your career at 30. That's when you're meant to be settling down. You can't change your career at 35. You should have had it figured out by then. Oh my God, you're not married at 38? What the hell are you doing with your life? Who comes up with this stuff? I have no idea. But this stuff plagues so many people that I speak to. So many people open up to me and say, Jay, I just don't know how to change. Is it possible? What do you think this guy was before he became who he is? He used to be a PE teacher, right? Sports teacher at a high school. How about her? She was a telemarketer for two weeks. How about her? She applied to be a funeral director. It's incredible. What happens in society is that we're clouded by the noise, the noise of family expectations, the noise of our parents, the noise of our brothers and sisters' expectations. I grew up in a family where you could either be a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure, right? Those were my three options. Anything else would just count me as a failure. I would have failed, so basically I failed, right? I'm standing up here in front of you all as a failure. I lived as a monk for three years. I committed career suicide. I turned down two amazing corporate job offers when I graduated from business school. I shaved my hair, I wore robes, and lived out of a gym locker for three years. And I did that because I thought I was gonna do something meaningful, help impact the world. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. But more than becoming a monk, what that trained me to do was drop out with the rules. People told me, if you come back in three years, you'll never get a job. They told me, if you become a monk, people are gonna think you're weird forever. No girl's ever gonna talk to you. People told me, they were, like, they were like, well, when you come back to real life, like, will you even be able to talk English? And people were just really weirded out. I'm just like, okay, I think monks speak English. And there was so much different noise that I was hearing when I made that decision. And the funny thing is, from having not been a monk for four years now, I'm in one of the most incredible periods of my life that I could ever have asked for. And so much of that is based on the fact that I decided to do something different. So many of the times our expectations are driving us in a certain scenario. We focus so much on life in what we want to be as opposed to who we want. Because we've always been told that life and jobs and careers are like boxes and containers. There's only a finite number of options. There is no formula, there is no pattern. If you know what you're passionate about, if you know what you're good at and you invest in that. People say follow your passions, I say forget that. Invest in your passion. If you're passionate about something, go and become the best at it. Go and do a course on it. Go and learn from the best. Go and find a mentor who's gonna make you incredible at that trait. Not only will you be criticized and grow, you'll be able to find new things about yourself that you never knew. Don't trade who you are for who you think the world needs, because the world needs you to be you, and I mean that. People ask me all the time, what is the secret to success? And I always tell them what the short version is, you gotta have a 22 inch biceps. And you got to be able to kill predators with your bare hands. And of course, you got to have this charming Austrian accent. This is a, that's a given. The long version is that I actually always had five rules. You don't need to be a bodybuilding champion. You don't need to want to be an action hero or anything like that. If you want to excel in whatever you do, those rules are for you. So my first rule is find your vision and follow it. If you don't have a goal, if you don't have a vision, you just drift around. You're not going to be happy. I grew up after the Second World War. Austria, right along with Germany, lost the Second World War. There was, of course, depression. There was a terrible economic situation. I wanted to get out of there. I wanted to escape. And luckily, one day in school, I watched a documentary about America. I knew exactly that is where I wanted to end up. The question was just, how do I get there? How do I get to America? No one had the money to travel or anything. But one day I was fortunate enough to see a bodybuilding magazine. And on the cover was this very muscular guy. Mr. Universe becomes Hercules star. His name was Reg Park. I read the article as fast as I could, learning about how he grew up in Leeds in England, poor, and how he trained five hours a day, every single day, and trained and trained and trained, and then he finally became Mr. Great Britain and then became Mr. Universe. And then he won a second Mr. Universe title and a third Mr. Universe title. And then all of a sudden he landed in Rome in Chinichita doing Hercules movies. And as I read, I became more and more certain. I had that vision very clearly laid out to be a champion on that same stage where he won the Mr. Universe and then to move to America, then get into movies. From that moment on, everything that I did, no matter how hard I had to work, 
or how much I had to struggle, it didn't matter because I knew what the purpose was and I found my passion. Always discover your vision and the rest will follow. Now my second, my second rule is never ever think small. You have to go and shoot for the stars. I didn't just think about being in movies. No, I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to have a bath the title building. I wanted to become the highest paid entertainer. I basically wanted to be another John Wayne. What's wrong with that? Never think small, think big. My third rule is ignore the naysayers. I think it is natural that when you have a big vision and big dreams and you have big goals that people are gonna say around you, I don't think it can be done. I think it's impossible. I mean, it started right away when I was 15 years old and I became a bodybuilder. Right after that happened, I said, I want to be a world champion in bodybuilding. I want to be Mr. Universe. They immediately said, are you crazy? Bodybuilding is an American sport. Forget about it. It's nuts. And then when I wanted to go into show business, after I won 13 world championship titles in bodybuilding, I said, I want to be like Reg Park. I want to be a Hercules. I want to get into movies. Well, I tell you, when I met those agents and managers, their reaction was, <laughs> Oh, Arnold, that is so funny. <laughs> you want to be what? A leading man? Oh, come on. I mean, look, uh, uh, first of all, let's start with your body. You're gigantic. You're like a monster. And then your accent, oh, it gives me the chills just listening to your German bullshit. Come on now. Have you ever seen an international movie star with a German accent? It doesn't happen. Forget about that. And then your name, what is it, Schwarzen Schnitzel or something like that? People are going to storm the theater and the movie houses because Schwarzen Schnitzel is starring in a movie. Oh yeah, I can see that already. Imagine that. Everywhere I turned, they said, no, it won't happen. It's not going to happen and forget about it. Luckily, I did not listen. I started taking acting classes, English classes, even accent removal classes. I ran around all day saying lines like, a fine wine grows on a vine. All of a sudden, I got a little break. All of a sudden, I got a TV show. A little part, then another little part, and then pumping on and stay hungry. And then, of course, I landed the big role of Conan the Barbarian. So finally, I got the big, big break. And you know what was so interesting about it was the director said at the press conference, if we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger, with those muscles, we would have had to build one. And then when I did Terminator, James Cameron said, the I'll Be Back line became one of the most famous movie lines in history because of Arnold's crazy accent, because he sounded like a machine. So as you see, everything that the naysayers said was a liability became an asset. Ignore the naysayers. The fourth rule is, work your ass off. You never want to fail because you didn't work hard enough. It doesn't matter in what area you're in. No pain, no gain. Listen, when I came to the United States, I remember that I trained five hours a day, every day, and I was managing a construction business and I was a bricklayer. And I went to college also. And I took acting classes from eight o'clock at night to 12 o'clock midnight. Every day I did that. Work your butt off. That's what I always believe. No matter what you do, work, work, work. My fifth and last rule is don't just take. Give something back. Tear down that mirror that makes you always look at yourself. And you will be able to look beyond that mirror. And you will see the millions and millions of people that need your help. And this is why I tried to take every opportunity that I could to give something back. I started training Special Olympians. I started after school programs for the most vulnerable children, for innocent children, to make them be able to say no to drugs, no to gangs and no to violence. We all can create change, whether it is in our neighborhood or in our local schools, because the bottom line is, it is up to us. Have a vision, think big, ignore the naysayers, work your ass off and give back and change the world. Because if not us, who, if not now, when? Do you have the emotional maturity, the EQ, emotional quotient, to go through the highs and the lows of what it takes to be successful? Because if you're going to be successful, 
You learn from the lows how to ride on the highs. I want to talk to you about change. And the one thing that you can count on is there will always be change. And if you don't plan on the change as a leader, that will determine how successful you are, whether it is good change or bad change, there will always be change. And generally there will be both. Learn as much from your failures as you do from your successes. I think one of the most difficult things that can happen to people in leadership is to step into leadership that you didn't grow and that you didn't groom because you don't know where the issues are. There's something about being on the trajectory yourself and taking the roller coaster ride and riding the wave that makes a big difference as it relates to leadership. When you, when you think about it, think about it this way. We, we often, when we select leaders or we want to evaluate people or we want to choose staff, we quickly want to know about their IQ, where they went to school, what their background is, because we we're, we're trying to find out in a nice way, are you smart? We want to know about your IQ, your intellectual ability, the quotient of intellectualism that you have through which to handle and manage situations based on your IQ. The second thing that we really need to be asking, and we really don't know this until we get into it, is your EQ. <laughs> I'm talking about your emotional quotient your range of emotion and how you handle stress and pressure because many many times you can have people on your team and on your side who have the intellectual ability to do what you're trying to get them to do but they do not have the emotional wherewithal and you don't know it till you get on the ride what you want to know is can you handle the down ride do you turn into somebody else when the, when when things start getting crazy do you have the emotional maturity, the EQ, emotional quotient, to go through the highs and the lows of what it takes to be successful? Because if you're going to be successful, you learn from the lows how to ride on the highs. So if you can't take the dip, you can't take the climb. You have to have the emotional wherewithal to go on the journey and to be comfortable and to remain cool in a crisis not lose your head, not freak out, even though you want to. You can do it on the inside. You can be like a screaming year old, six year old girl on the inside, but on the outside, you have to maintain your cool. Because there is nothing as frightening as a frightened leader. That's what happens when you hire somebody who has the IQ but doesn't have the EQ to handle the ride, who freaks under pressure who starts screaming at the staff, who starts yelling at the employees, and they just fall apart under pressure. So you want to make sure they have good IQ, you want to make sure they have good EQ, but here's the thing that is most important, and there is no test for it. They're AQ, and we never talk about AQ. You've heard people talk about IQ, you hear people talk about EQ, you don't hear people talk about AQ. AQ is your adaptability quotient. Are you adaptable? How do you respond to change? And let me tell you, I'm not sure which is the most challenging, the ride up or the ride down. Because success can be just as daunting as failure is. It can throw you off kilter. If you can't adapt quickly enough to it, you will lose it. You can have more opportunities than you have infrastructure. A blessing isn't a blessing if you can't handle it. So do you have the adaptability in your plan for what you're getting ready to do next? Do you have the ability to adapt to better, worse, richer, poor, sickness, health? You could be praying to win something that you can't handle if you get it. If you hire people for where you are, you wasted money if they can't go where you're going. Are you following what I'm saying? So you have to have that adaptability to be able to transition from one state into the, to the next. And when, when, the, when the thing gets rough and it gets tough, what you need as a leader and as a thinker is not just the success to get there, but the success to stay there, sustainability. Most people in a session like this lack sustainability. They're like dogs chasing cars. And maybe the dog gets lucky and catches a car in a red light or something like that, but there's one thing that the dog never considered. I can't drive. You might be chasing after something that you can't run. 
It's not just about getting there, it's sustainability after you get there. But can you run it after you get it? What gives people comfort in leadership is when there is a commitment to stability in the midst of fluctuations. So, so the whole issue, the only thing that should be stable in your ride to success is you. And if you're not a person who can be stable in the ride, you shouldn't get in the car. The best thing to do with bad news is to deliver a clear, accurate, concise message. Clear messaging creates clear expectation, which avoids disappointment. People can handle bad news if they can trust your message. This is what happened. This is how we're going to handle it. And we are sorry. It is not what happens to you that matters. It is how you handle it. Stress is an indicator. It's a benefit. It's a favor. It lets you know you're at your limits. It does not mean that you cannot do it, but it does mean you have to change something. Anytime there is stress, you have to change structure or strategy. Whenever I am stressed out, it is an indication that I don't have the strategy or the structure for where I'm at. And that stress is a warning bell that you need to reboot, recalibrate, and either change your structure or your strategy for what's about to happen in your life. And I want you to think, since you're probably gonna be working with limited people, you got big dreams, but limited budget, and you've got a lot of people, a small amount of people to handle. Are, are they tough enough? Do they have the structure to handle the stress of winning? If you build a life that never says you won, all you're gonna end up with is tired. Okay, so make this note, the future's where we're going. You know, the past is where we've been, the present is where we are, and the future is where we're going. And if we can capture this moment in time from our past to now, and then from now to a future more well-designed with better objectives and better purpose uh, for ourselves, our family, our business, our investments, everything else, then this, this moment in time will have become extremely valuable. So let me give you first what really affects us all. Number one, we're affected by the environment in which we live. We're affected by the physical environment. I was challenged way back in those early days, why not make the environment better everywhere you go? I learned, mama taught, you know, turn off the lights when you check out of your hotel and you leave the room before you leave, turn out the lights. And I thought, why do that? And here's what she said, to make a contribution that's so easy. And if you could make a contribution that is so easy, that didn't cost you any money, and didn't cost you any time, you know, didn't cost you a, a piece of your life, why not make the contribution that's easy? Because if everybody did it, think of how much we would conserve. Someone says, well, yes, but the hotel benefits if you turn out all the lights. And here's the answer that sophisticated people always have. Who cares who benefits? If it benefits the hotel and if everybody did it, probably the cost of the hotel room would come down. So every benefit you can give, every benefit you can share, because here's what happens. If you learn to give, you will what? Receive. Maybe not in the manner in which you gave, maybe not in like kind. Uh, someone will save energy for you because you saved energy for them. But in some mysterious ways, it always comes back to us. If you give, you will receive. In fact, here's what it says, that for the uneducated is a little bit strange. It says it's better to give than it is to receive. Now see, if you didn't understand, you would say, that doesn't quite make sense. Surely it would be better to receive than to give, and the answer is no. It is much better to give than to receive. And here's why. It's what we call being in having intelligent self-interest. 
Nothing wrong with self-interest as long as you do it the intelligent way. Here's the key. Giving starts the receiving process. So to act intelligently in your own self-interest, which is good, it's much better to give than it is to receive. Because if all of you do, all you do is receive, that may be very limited. But if you give and giving starts the receiving process coming your way from unknown resources and from unknown places, back it comes around to you because you became a giver. That's one of the unique mysteries of life. We give to receive, and it's better to give than it is to receive. So that's what Mama said, turn out the lights, make a contribution. Why not make the easy ones? It raises your self-esteem, plus your self-respect, that you do things that the average person doesn't do. Maybe if they were taught, they would. Maybe if somebody mentioned it, they would. But it's easy for most everybody to just go on their way and if they're not interrupted by a good idea that says, hey, it's so easy to make a contribution, this one would be easy. Turn out the lights when you leave the hotel room and make a contribution. Next is the phrase, in terms of environment, always leave something better than you found it. I talked to a man one time who rented out of apartments, and he said, Mr. Owen, you wouldn't believe it, but when somebody rents an apartment, they usually leave it worse than when they rented it. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no. A high percentage of people leave it trashed. If they stay six months or stay one year, they leave it trashed. Why would anyone do that? Mama said to me, no, leave it, what? Better than you found it. See, that's just a commitment to your own self-esteem. And why not do it if it makes a contribution to your self-esteem? It's called intelligent self-interest. Self-interest says, I wish to be ruler over many. And intelligent self-interest says, I understand how to do that. Be faithful when the amounts are small. If you'll take care of the few, we will someday give you a position of very high importance over many. But if you don't be disciplined when the amounts are small, why would we trust you when the amounts are large? Why would, why would life give you a fortune to manage if you couldn't manage the gifts of a few? Interesting philosophy to consider. Your own self-interest leave the contribution. Doing things that most people don't do. If everybody differed, what, did it, what a different country we would have. But it doesn't really matter. You say, well, if everybody's going to do it, why shouldn't I do it? And the answer is for your own dignity and for your own self-esteem. You do things that most other people allow themselves to do that you don't do. So when I talk about the environment, now we're affected by the political environment and the social environment. And we're affected by the economy environment. All of us are persuaded in one way or another to live like we live. Here's a good word to jot down, association. Be very careful of your associations. Here's what we've discovered. People that are around people that spend all they make, chances are excellent, what? They spend all they make. It's just part of that association. Once you're sort of in it, you sort of do what everyone else does. So here's the key to association. Number one is limited association. Some people you can spend, you know, a few hours with, but not a few days. Some you can spend a few days, but not a lifetime. Some you can spend a little time, but not a lot of time. Limit your associations because of the influence. All of us have to be around people, you know, that have a variety of their own, uh, you know, beliefs and what they do that influences us or is there. You know, it, it's in our presence wherever we go. But here's the whole key. Some of us limited association. Here's the next one. This one is kind of severe, and that is discontinue association sometimes you have to say in an association you know is it causing me more harm than good and sometimes the time finally comes where you have to part ways just because the association is not to your benefit you know for the rest of your life and then here's the one you've engaged in this weekend expanded association get around people who have good ideas to share get around people who have a good story to share one of the great benefits of being here this weekend is a chance for all of you to meet each other, share testimonials, share ideas, share your reactions to the 
what's been taught to the ideas that's been presented. Uh, share some common uh, experiences you might have had in your life and you go home with this bag full of testimonials and the inspiration that comes from it. This kind of expanded association is so valuable. Whenever there's an occasion and it can fit into your schedule of time and money, make sure you go where there are people of like interest, right? Ready for good ideas. Uh, never, you know, too successful to learn some more. This is good environment, expanded association. Next, we're affected by events, dramatic events or worldwide events or home events or personal events. Some events affect us all. Here's number four. We're all affected by our results, whatever they've been, the results of our errors or the results of our disciplines. Now, here's what's so staggering about being a human being. It's possible immediately upon decision to start a new program of changing results. If you're headed in a certain direction and it looks like in five years you're gonna wind up here, and you take a look at that in five years and you say, yes, it looks like what I'm doing right now, if I continue doing what I'm doing now, it looks like in five years I will wind up here. Let's say that suddenly on careful consideration you decide that's not a very good place, that's not a very exciting place to arrive. Is it possible as a human being to change your destination point five years from now? And the answer is yes. See, that is so extraordinary. No other life form can do that. Pick a different, de different destination in five years and start making plans and learn the skills and accept the disciplines and the teaching and the training and the consistency of effort and just start going in a new direction. And in five years from now, wind up at a totally different place than where it was assumed you were gonna arrive with the old plans. Only human beings have this extraordinary ability to change the outcome, to pick a new direction and go that way, to pick a more certain place to go and read the books and attend the classes and develop the disciplines and find the people and do the business, whatever, that takes you to that new destination. So we're affected by that. Next. We're affected by knowledge. Whatever you know has brought you to where you are. What you've missed in the past, right? At this particular moment, you might could have arrived at a much better place if you hadn't missed what you missed in the past. But now knowledge can turn it all around. Knowledge can start us on a new track. Knowledge can help us not only to review the past, but to peer into the future and say, would it possible to be possible to have a more unique design for the future than what I've had in the past? And the answer to all of that is yes. So these five things primarily were affected by, no, here's the fifth one. We're affected by our dreams, our ability to see the future and give it design, things, places, people, career, fortune, whatever might become important to you for the balance of your life or especially over the next 10 years. It's possible to reach into the future personally. Now, most of the time we don't do it. Here's why we don't really reach into the future. We're trapped either by regret of the past or the routine of the present. So busy with the routine of the present, we don't give much thought to designing the future. Or trapped by the past with regrets of past losses and past failures and past mistakes. And we relive it over and over again, not to the benefit of changing it for the future, but just because, you know, we feel that our lives have been less than favorable simply because of all the things that's happened to us in the past. But here's the real key, is to spend some time, and usually we don't do it until someone comes by and offers the suggestion. That's why meeting the right person at the right time, attending the right class, listening to the right sermon, having a conversation with the right person, sometimes can totally change the direction of your life. And you're never the same after that personal contact, or sitting in that class, or reading that book, or coming face to face with someone who says, hey, you know, our lives are not that good, what could we do to change? And that very conversation starts this whole process. Wow. 
I'm arrived, arrived at a fairly poor place. How could I change all of that for the future? And that is all possible. And this point of contact, maybe today, will help change all of that and give some of you a new glimpse of some of the possibilities. We talked a little bit earlier about the possibilities and believing that the possibilities were possible for you then going to work and make them happen. Here's the next key. Make sure that the greatest pull on you is the pull of the future, not the pull of the past that keeps taking you back, not the pull of gravity like the present that just keeps you sort of stuck where you are. But we want to make sure that the greatest influence and pull on us is the pull of the future. We'd like to thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again.